my God, John. I feel like I've known you my whole life. We've never met. I'm going to tell you where I'm sitting because it's so crazy. I'm on a houseboat in Far Rockaway, Queens, New York. Oh, wow. (laughs) It was so great. When I saw it, where is that? Does that come? The size of it? Did they come down or were they straight? (laughs) No, I swear to God, it's literally batten down the hatches. Oh, the hatches are battened okay, down. Okay, okay, I've got um, you now. I can see that. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> I'm on a boat. I'm on a boat. What are you doing on a boat? Please say. Or well, tell. COVID, you know, and all of my travels were grounded, and I, I live, I live by Columbia in Manhattan. I live in what I call upstate Manhattan, which is a little right. inside joke because there's like parks everywhere, and it's so beautiful and wonderful but, um, and quiet, but, um, but COVID, I just needed to get out of the city. And so I went to a different part of the city. (laughs) (laughs) So this is my little secret escape. It's fantastic. It's a great frame. I mean, I would love to show you the rest of the boat, but we ch- I tried all kinds of lighting to see, like, if I could show you the water and it oh. just, it's too, you'd be too blinded by the, yeah. by the gloriousness of the light. <laughs> and, and so it didn't work, but right to my right, I'm looking at swans in Jamaica Bay and there's mm. JFK mm. and planes are flying overhead. It's just a very strange situation, but it's wonderful, wow. wonderfully strange. And I have to say, John, I'm so honored to meet you um oh, i just i are you friends with jim i'm a jim's one of my dear 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 friends and i lived in london for many years i was at cambridge <laughs> as a postdoc when i was a young kid kind of kicking out of graduate school right. and jim was a very dear friend and i just feel like you were somebody i would have met in london yeah had i stayed yeah No, we would have definitely have met. Totally. And it's such a pleasure and honor to meet you. It's a real pleasure to meet you, Sweet. And I I wanted to so meet you because um, I was frankly absolutely terrified (laughs) the idea of having having a conversation with an astrophysicist. I'm very scary. (laughs) I'm very scary, me. I was absolutely terrified. So I thought, yeah. okay, let me go check yeah. her out. Yeah, I'm going to make I... you calculate the area <laughs> of, you know, a, a hyperbolic manifold. <laughs> so I went on your on your platform and, I mean, just listening to you talk yeah. about your ex-Mancunian boyfriend. Completely oh, who's now my husband? Oh, he is. <laughs> I clearly didn't get far enough then. <laughs> No, it, the book doesn't, the book ends before that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Was... Um, but it's funny. So speaking of film, so I, I told a moth story. I don't know if you know about the moth in England as much, but here in New York, it's a very, very beautiful, special venue. Mm. It's, it's called the moth because of, uh, imagine sitting out on your porch in the heat of an August night and mm. the moth is drawn to the flame as people tell stories. Right. So it's a storytelling night, and the um, the moth has become huge here in the states. Mm. It has its own radio hour, and I know that they do air their shows sometimes on the BBC and 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 in Europe. But um, I told a moth story about this, and um, and recently um, sold the film rights. So we're going to make exactly what you were reading about into a film. <laughs> And here you are a filmmaker, so we have a nice little hey. connect because I'm ter- like I'm terrified. Oh no, no, no need to Because I have all. no control over the film. Yeah, that that is um that is true. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that is no true. Point in lying to you about that. No point, don't butter it up for me, man. No. Just give it to me straight. <laughs> that is absolutely true. But John, I, mean, I have to say, so when I was watching some of your films in preparation mm-hmm. for speaking to you, um, mm-hmm. I was so struck in particular by one of your really early films. Mm-hmm. I mean, your films, to my mind, just get more and more gorgeous. Oh, just you. more and more like luscious and gorgeous. But the 1987 piece mm. about the riots in Britain, yeah. Yeah. Um, damn, if it isn't painful, how relevant it is. Mm. How much I wish I was watching that thinking, 
This isn't relevant anymore. This is obsolete. How I wish your film was not relevant anymore. It's so 35 I. years later and the first scene where they're dragging this kid. Yeah. And they're they're there's like they're camp they're pushing each other off to hit him. They're pushing each other off for the mm -hmm. opportunity mm -hmm. to beat this kid. Mm -hmm. And I just I have to ask you, having having made that film, how are you watching this? What's going on in the US? How are you processing this? Yeah, no, the US is <laughs> okay. I mean, um, a, a couple of things. Um, one of the things that I find really interesting mm -hmm. uh, about the moment is that something Hands Were Songs, the film you were talking about, was trying to do is now completely unmasked. You know, it's, it's out there. So um, in 87, if you made a film about a disturbance, you had to sidestep very gently the agency of the police because mm -hmm. there was almost a unanimous feeling on both the left and right that, that really the police are just doing their job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. they, they're not really involved. It just so happened they get caught up in these civil disturbances. You know, um, it just so happened that most of the civil disturbances or riots, if we will, that started in England usually started with a policing incident. You know? Mm -hmm. um, and that was an arrest, right? Yeah. There was an arrest that yeah. ignited. There was a wrongful arrest. Mm -hmm. um, and the manner of the arrest was a little bit like what happened in Minnesota. So this young man's head was being lent on a bus, almost run over his head, and people were looking at this saying, stop, stop. He wouldn't, you know, Oof. the police wouldn't. And so pff, things were off. So I, th I think that much is progress. We now know that, that the policing is a central feature of these disturbances yeah. and yeah. Um, and thank god for that yeah. so because then you can now talk directly about the kinds of policing that's necessary mm -hmm. or desirable and all the rest of it. and and, yeah. and that's that's definite development you know but yeah. the bit which is um uh, difficult to live with still yeah yeah you know is is the sort of um necropolitics of it, you know, the, 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 this feeling that somehow um, black death <laughs> is a necessary feature of policing. That, that I, I find... Um, I mean, difficult. it's even why the phrase, you know, Black Lives Matter was yeah. so resonant, yeah. right? Yeah. Because, yeah. because it's exactly that. It's exactly what you're talking about. Everybody can see that if you look. Yeah. Yeah. That that yeah. that what you're describing, like, oh, black death is just, you know, it's just a yeah. necessary consequence of policing. <laughs> you know? Why should we worry about this? Absolutely. It's just part of keeping the peace. <laughs> and so that phrase was like immediately like because yeah. it really it really does strike a chord. It really does. And it's tough and, and in the, the phrase... States now. It's tough now, man. It's tough mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. we're going through here. Mm -hmm. It's a so, uprising, yeah. a, a long overdue uprising, but why is it 2020? You made this film in 1987 I know. and it's 2020 <laughs> and we need an uprising. Oh. My kids need to be educated about this stuff. They're, mm. they're learning about it fresh. Mm. Mm. You know, it's not the history. It's mm. not like, oh, this long thing happened. You know, long ago, this thing happened. Yeah. But you know, it's this like is, their lives now. No, they're marching. This, they're protesting. This feels to me like a good moment to um to ask ask you a question because mm -hmm. actually, um, what's brought us together is long player, long form, yes. the long durée of long player. Uh, and, and I'm certain... very good in long form. I do very <laughs> okay, things for me are like billions of years time scale. Do you, do you, does it feel uh, like something worth hanging on to still? I mean, do we have a future? Oh my God, that's so painful, John. I mean, I don't- You know what I mean? Does it, what does it I feel I don't, like? you know, you said something in your previous conversation, I was eavesdropping about how sometimes when um, it's a person-focused mm. scene, mm. 
Mm. The whole scene is just two people talking and that's the focus. Yeah. It's not the <laughs> background scene, it's not the music. And, and I, I think I really relate to what you're saying with that because sometimes I just think maybe that's not the most interesting aspect of the human experience, mm. meaning mm. other humans, society, culture. I love these things. They're mm. important to me. I am a person. Mm. But is it the most important aspect? And for me, it's not. So mm. some of my work, human beings didn't live yet. Mm. You know, I mm. often joke, I'm not interested in anything that happened more recently than a billion years ago. To me, that's like solar system politics. That's like local politics. Like, <laughs> I don't care about the solar system. I hardly know. I hardly know the constellations. Let's just get it out there. Okay. But if it happened a billion years ago, mm. I got that. Yeah. That I understand. I know all about the universe at that time. Human beings did not exist. Like, and so mm. to presume that the only thing we have to offer or mm. to reflect on or to derive meaning from involves faces and humans is yeah. like not, it's not never too. resonated with yeah, me. Absolutely. And, and, and I get a lot of meaning from that. I get a lot of meaning from understanding that there was a big bang. And then, and then, and then billions of years into that stars formed and then those stars made chemical elements and then they exploded mercifully, generously populating the ecosystem with elements that created life. <laughs> and so when I hear that narrative, I feel a moving, meaningful connection and it gives me a sense of purpose and stuff. And I don't need to only like look at humanity for that sense of purpose. Oh, oh, for that to happen. No, not at all. And so, you know, your question, I kind of perverted, but if society comes and falls, of course, that's the case. I mm. deal on timescales of billions of years and sometimes numbers that are so big that they don't have cute names. Yeah. Bigger than trillions, the goo plexes of years. And so, of course, civilization's gone. I mean, there has been no society in the history of humanity that's lasted for a thousand years, which is what Jem's ambition is for long player. Yes. <laughs> no society in the history of humanity has lasted for a thousand years. And when I'm dealing on these huge timescales, of course, I understand this civilization is going to be gone. And, and yet, you know, we should feel good and we should enjoy and we should feel meaning in the fact that we're able to project into the future and to understand that and to understand we'll be gone by then mm -hmm. but to still you know take pride and pleasure in having some sketch of not only what our past was but like mm -hmm. what our future is mm -hmm. you know you know the thing which so, um, the thing i find um really interesting about long player is mm -hmm. is that actually it's prophetic stance it's sensed that there has to be a thousand years later. It's a it's a gesture of hope. Yeah. But, like Jem, you know, as you know, is such a sweetheart. Yes. <laughs> and such a positive person. Yeah. And such an optimist that by making long player, he's saying, hmm, I believe that despite all the evidence of history, which I also want to talk to you about history, because I mm, think you have sure. a very interesting perspective on that. Um he believes we're going to be here in a thousand years. Mm. Like that's, mm. that's, that's, that's an optimism. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great, but and an see, innocence. The, thing, the thing is that that, that default of his yeah. is almost, the reason I find that so attractive is because as I've gone on this path, it's become clearer to me that actually yeah. that is also the default of all images, right? All images mm. have this slightly prophetic, quality mm. to me because mm. they they are about recording moments mm -hmm. which will only live in the elsewhere in the future if you like you know like all images why do, if you why do anything <laughs> unless you believe it will live on yeah yeah and you know i actually think this is really this was something I'm, i found so really deeply interesting in your work, which is something that we connect on, which is a sense of time. Yeah. And you, you clearly have an eye on history, mm. but then sometimes you're like in the future, mm. like the future. Mm. And then sometimes you're in now mm. and, mm. 
And I wonder if that, like in your films, when you're thinking about chronology, if it's different for you to think about history, futurism, mm. now. Nice. Or are those different elements to you? Or, 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 or are they fluid? Can you imagine the future being history? Do you think like about the future and think, oh, one day that's somebody's history? Yeah. Or, you know what I mean? Oh, that's so interesting. And yeah. now I mean, it's somebody's, and now, now like you're, you're talking about um, like Mississippi blues, Mm. And we're mm. in the future for, for that person, mm. Mm. you know? Mm. And um, and so, yeah, I just, I'm sort of fascinated no, by so that. Fascinated. I mean, I can't believe that I'm having this conversation with an astrophysicist. <laughs> it's, it's so freaking, you know, interesting. <laughs> because of course, you know, as you said in the beginning, the question of time and temporality is absolutely central. But your mm. your long durée is so fucking long that, that mm. in a way, a lot of what yeah. I'm talking about pales yeah. in significance. <laughs> Nevertheless, it seems to me that there's a move that you that your work is about, which is tracking time. You know, I mean, I, complexities, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I um, you know, I'm. I, it's funny. I've learned to become very comfortable with notions of the relativity of time. It doesn't bother mm. me at all. I don't even think it's mysterious anymore. Mm. So I feel like Einstein explained it to us so clearly. Mm. And and even if society comes and falls, like there's, it's it's the road. You know, Cormac McCarthy's the road. It's the apocalypse. Yes. It's the end yes. of it all. Like all knowledge is lost. If one single person remembers relativity. They mm. can teach it to everybody else. Mm. And that's something very special about science, mm. right? That mm. it's then, it's, it's authorless. Mm. Mm. And, um, and nobody needs to remember it was Einstein who did it. Mm. It's just something that can be taught. And, and in relativity, I feel very comfortable with the understanding that time, you know, it's not absolute. Right. But I still struggle with other aspects. They, they're in, they're, they're, they're posing a challenge, you know, it, it, it's, it's like the physics itself, the math itself mm. is telling us where to look, mm. you know, to, to find solutions to our understanding of math. It tells us where to look. It's saying, you know, you're doing really well with relativity. It's a brilliant theory, general relativity. And it tells us about black holes and the big bang and the expansion of space time and, and, and rotations in space and time. And all this is wonderful. But then it literally puts like a big blasting signpost and says, I'm not doing so well right here. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. understanding of time beyond this is right here. Dig here, man, you know? And, um, and it's, it's like fascinating to follow the clues. We're See, literally I chasing the clues. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. See, I, I mean, I know because I've read some of what you, your work, um, mm -hmm. what some of your writings around the work, let's put it that way, <laughs> not the work itself. Yeah. And, and, you know, so I'm going to try and resist using you know, astrophysics as metaphors for, for things. Because I Feel know, welcome. Feel welcome. <laughs> I know it's not one of the things you're very keen on. So no, no rules here. Like, we're, yeah. you know, we're but you know, and, and Nevertheless, there is a kind of imprint of temporality in the work, you know, uh, which uh, yeah. um, in a hmm. way is the, is the, the modernist sense of time that I'm trying to work with. Hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's post Einsteinian mm. the definition of time. So I mean, interesting. In a sense that one understands its fracture, one understands yes. its multiplicity, mm. um, and, and the combinations and connections. And its duplicity. Between, yeah. You know, it's not always a friendly, it's not always a friendly agent. No. Yeah. No. And it's not necessarily linear. <laughs> it's so you know? so interesting to hear you say that because in even in my books, I, I, I mean, not every, not not all of them, but in some, I play with the linearity of time, mm. Mm. and and how do you jump out of chronology in a way that isn't just a conceit, like a literary conceit, yeah. but it's it feels necessary mm. to jump out of the time to understand it better, yeah, like. Yeah. 
I try not to do stuff just to be jarring, mm. right, in my writing, but I try to do it to be provocative. Right. And also, maybe this is more logical to go from this era to the past, to the future, mm. to the pre present. Mm. It's mm. not just a, a goof, you know? No. It's like maybe this actually conveys something more strongly mm. than if I was linear yeah. in time. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's very interesting um, structurally. Like obviously lots of people have played with time. Um, I mean, but I think that... it's because almost intuitively, sorry to interrupt, but almost intuitively no, no, no. we it... all know there's something wrong with our understanding of time. We mm. all kind of intuitively mm. understand we don't get it. You know, I I like the phrase jarring. I, I really <laughs> um, yeah. because in a way um, that's precisely what I I've been trying to use, especially in the recent work, which are more multi screens rather than single screen. I mean, I'm trying very hard to use a sense of jarring as a mm. as a compositional tool, as a narrative yeah. device. You know, so yeah. that you can have across, for instance, three screens, three mm. different representations of time or three moments. I definitely yeah. sense that in your pieces. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I absolutely viscerally sense. I, don't, I, I was reminding myself this morning and um, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not gonna remember which piece it is. Um, no, don't worry, <laughs> Jesus. <sighs> Vestige, remind me. Um, so, so the middle piece was clearly on a different time. It's like a few, it's like jazz. Yeah. Sometimes I look at what you're doing as jazz. So I'm you have somebody, true. somebody keeping a beat right in the yeah. center. Boom, yeah. boom, yeah. boom, yeah. boom, yeah. boom, yeah. boom. Yeah. And then on the periphery is like the something else. Game play, like the the yeah. the riffing. Yeah. 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 And it's really effective in the same way that jazz is effective because jazz by rights should be awful. Yeah. <laughs> With Tim Marsalis was like, yeah. It should be yeah. like so irritating, <laughs> but instead it's like, wait, what? <laughs> like it's, it's, you know, brilliant. And you're like, what was that? What just, what just happened then? And you're chasing it, right? Yeah. And it's like a flirtation. It's like a constant. Indeed. Indeed. I so mean, that's, I, I feel that you're a, doing that in the time in your pieces, in the three panels that you're specifically like different jazz musicians playing, playing, playing a trio. I mean, I'm very influenced. Um, I'm like, influence sounds like, you know, I'm trying to transpose what they do onto, onto our field. It's not that at all. It's just mm -hmm. that um, when you're, uh, a word that came up a lot in our last conversation was proximity. When you're, yeah. when you have this proximity to something, there's a, yeah. there's a way in which it's aura and glow leaves a sort of imprint yeah. on your soul, really, you know. And jazz yeah. has definitely done that, especially its, its examples. It's what I call its charismatic examples. You know? yeah. so the sense in which it says that in the process of trying to do something, uh, elisions and, and ellipses and accidents and chance yeah. encounters that all yeah. of these can be woven into some sort of symbolic order for yeah right yeah. in which you know things don't lose their uh, the their discordant shape. yeah they yeah. don't lose their shape just because they've been forced into this unity right. and the unity it's literally like carry. conversation yeah yeah it's a kind it's of literally ongoing like what we're doing indeed <laughs> But we That's did, why it's so strong. Yeah, we do that by by being absolutely intensely listening to each other to see where the moments and gaps might appear in order to say yeah. something, right? <laughs> and also, and then also, like, oh, I was go, I had my intention to do this, but this, I just want to respond to it instead, right? Mm. And that's the whole improvisation mm. is that mm. you know you don't go there having prepped what your what your guitars you know, your bass slapping solo is going to be, mm. you might do that just in case it's a bad set. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's a good set, somebody's going to do something that's going to make you think in that moment, 
Mm. How do I want to respond to this mm. moment? Yeah. And that's exactly what this like wonderful experience is to meet you. It's that, you know, mm. I would not, could not prepare this conversation. You know, if you, if anyone wanted to know um, what makes the music that we clearly both love so important, mm -hmm. um, one of the uh, sessions I really recommend is the Miles Davis group in 64, mm -hmm. Playing mm. at the plugged nickel. I mean, it's a huge amount of money, and I wouldn't recommend anyone buys it. But if you know someone who's got it, I would. I would just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. it's five five CDs, and mm. um, each CD is a recording of an evening across mm. five evenings. So it's you know, right. and and they play basically the same stuff every yeah. set. The like same stuff, but and this is the major but. Every night, the same standards are played, and yet they never sound the same. Know. You know, they have an aura of sameness. But oh actually, my gosh! Deep listening, you realize that you know Herbie Hancock doesn't play the same chords in that track at that time as he did yesterday yeah. or the day. Yeah. You know, it's and it's this fantastic interplay, yeah, of embrace of the uncertain. Yeah. You know, which yeah. uh, I just love about it. And I, in a and way, also, the, work, the fearlessness, the fear, no, yeah. just, just, just the fearlessness yeah. of, of, of making a mistake, like the fearlessness of, you know, improvising mm. is mm. so brave. Mm. And basically, as human beings, that's what we're asked to do all the time. Yeah. And is, you know, we're, we're, we're getting more and more corporatized and more and more uh, taught how to, um, train ourselves to respond in a certain way in any circumstance with other human beings. But mm. what we really love is improvising. Mm. That's thrilling, mm. you know? I, I think there are, very few, there are very few metaphors or examples mm -hmm. that lead us into some deep insight into what we are and why we are. Yeah. And, and improv at its best for me, offers one of the greatest examples of totally. who we are and what we are, you know, because, because it's, it's about affecting a kind of position vis-a-vis -vis yeah. another human being, another sentient being, which is as influenced by what they're doing as it is by just the moment that it's happening, the environment in which it's I'm happening. on a boat. You know? <laughs> yeah, right? All these things contribute. <laughs> and I'm in my studio at home. You know? Yeah. So these, these things matter, you know? Yeah. And every great improvisatory moment mm. is a kind of affirmation, if you will, of what it is to be a human being. Well, yeah. it's a, like a great conversation. Why is it thrilling? Mm. It's thrilling not because you're hearing yourself speak with your own thoughts that you already are familiar with. Mm. It's because somebody provoked you to mm. think differently mm. for that, for those few minutes, our 30 minutes together, our 29, our 29 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a, there's, there's a, suddenly you're like, oh, I didn't have this thought before mm. I actually got on the line with John. Mm. Right. No, absolutely. Yeah. I, I can tell you for a fact, many of the things I've said only came to me as, exactly. as you know, but, yeah. but, but they're all informed in some way by this desire to do justice yeah. to the durational presence of long player, you know? Like, like, total, like why didn't Miles Davis just perform solo all the time? He yeah. was Miles Davis. Yeah, he know. was a god. Yeah. He yeah. didn't because he needed them as much as they needed him, that, that relationship. Yeah. He needed and, them to know, remind him, to spark him, to prod him, to provoke him, to, to you know, to challenge him. And, and he, he always did it in the, in the same way. Every time he started a new band, Herbie Hancock to, tells his story about how mm -hmm. you're invited to his house, all the you know new yeah. band members, and you, you're playing, yeah. and yeah. you wouldn't see him, you know. Yeah. And then he'll come down after half an hour or something, listen for a bit, and go, mm -hmm. okay, and go off again. You know, once if you take out the, yeah. the sort of underlying sense of mastery that implies. There's also something quite endearing there, which is, you know, that Every everyone's human. giving, yeah, everyone's giving the room to grow into this new and relation. That's mm. literally 
ja like just the idea that jazz musicians hand over to the bassist, to the drummer, to the you know saxophonist. Four, three, two, one. <laughs> and I'm out. <laughs>